குட் ஈவினிங் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் ஐ வெல்கம் யூ ஆல் டு த ஹிந்து நியூஸ் பேப்பர் அனாலிசிஸ் ப்ராட் டு பை த சங்கர் ஐஏஎஸ் அகாடமி டுடேஸ் டேட் இஸ் டுவெண்ட்டி செகண்ட் டிசம்பர் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ பிஃபோர் என்ட்ரிங் ஆர் டிஸ்கஷன் ஐ ஹவ் அன் இம்பார்ட்டன் அனௌன்ஸ்மெண்ட் டு மேக் கேஸ் மார்க்ஸ் யூர் கேலண்டர் ஃபார் அன் அன்மிஸ்ஸபிள் ஆப்பர்ச்சுனிட்டி ஆர் யூ கேரிங் அப் ஃபார் த யூபிஎஸ்சி ப்ரிலிமினரி டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி ஃபோர் வெல் வி ஹவ் காட் த ஒர்க் ஷாப் ஜஸ்ட் ஒன்லி ஃபார் யூ ஜாயின் அஸ் ஃப்ரம் டிசம்பர் டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ டு டிசம்பர் தேர்ட்டி ஃபார் அன் எக்ஸ்க்ளூசிவ் அண்ட் ஃப்ரீ யூபிஎஸ்சி ப்ரிலிமினரி ஒர்க் ஷாப் வெதர் யூ ஆர் இன் அண்ணா நகர் ஆர் கனெக்டட் விர்ச்சுவலி ஃப்ரம் எனி பிரான்சஸ் திஸ் ஒர்க் ஷாப் இஸ் டெய்லர் மேட் டு ப்ரொப்பர் யூர் ப்ரிப்பரேஷன் டு த நெக்ஸ்ட் லெவல் ஆர் அஜெண்டா இட்ஸ் பேக்ட் வித் இன்சைட்ஸ் அண்ட் ஸ்ட்ராட்டஜிஸ் தட் யூ நீட் டு கிராக் த ப்ரிலிமினரி எக்ஸாமினேஷன் ஃப்ரம் சப்ஜெக்ட் ஸ்பெசிஃபிக் டிப்ஸ் அண்ட் ட்ரிக்ஸ் டு டைசெக்டிங் த ப்ரீவியஸ் கொஷன் பேப்பர்ஸ் அண்ட் அனலைசிங் த ட்ரெண்ட்ஸ் this workshop as it all if you are worrying about handling unknown areas fear not we have got you covered learn effective strategies to tackle those unfamiliar terrains with confidence see is c search stressing you out not anymore our experts will guide you through proven strategies to ace this session plus get ready for the personalized study plan designed to optimize your learning curve and understand the paramount importance of test series through brief storming and prefit Secure your spot for this intensive 7 day workshop. Limited offline seats available at Annanagar. So hurry up, register now and gear up to conquer UPSC preliminary 2024. I have attached the registration link in the description box. Don't miss this golden opportunity to set yourself on the path to success. Join us for the UPSC preliminary 2024 workshop and let us crack it together. See you there. So back to our discussion. Here are the list of articles which we are going to discuss today. So without wasting time, let us get into discussion. Look at this article the devil is back on Thursday Kerala announced that it is having around 87% of active covid cases in the country according to the union ministry of health and family welfare there were approximately 300 new infections and 3 deaths in the last 24 hours see this is the crux of the news article so in this context let us quickly revise about the basics of covid-19 firstly let us see about the basics of covid-19 disease see COVID-19 is a infectious zoonotic disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. See, it's an RNA based virus with ribonucleic acid or RNA as its genetic material instead of DNA. What does it mean? It means the virus can blend with the DNA of the host and can mutate rapidly. So due to this property of rapid mutation, it has become deadly in nature. Moreover, know that it's a member of coronavirus family which includes various other viruses which are being responsible for severe acute respiratory syndromes or sars and middle east respiratory syndrome or mers infections the interesting feature of the coronavirus is that it has many regularly arranged protrusions on its surfaces because of its the entire virus particle looks like an emperor's crown that's how it got its name coronavirus now let us see about the transmission of this virus see the virus primarily spreads through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs sneezes talks or breathes it can also spread by touching the surfaces which are contaminated with the virus and thereby touching the face particularly the mouth nose or eyes of a person now let us see the symptoms of the virus the common symptoms include fever cough shortness of breath fatigue muscle or body ache loss of taste or smell sore throat congestion etc symptoms may range from mild to severe and can appear 2 to 14 days after the exposure to the virus now let us see the major tests to detect the covid-19 virus firstly let us see the molecular test see the molecular test commonly known as rt pcr test it is used to directly detect the presence of the virus in the sample see this test detects the virus rna that is the genetic material of the virus a nasal or throat swab sample is generally being taken for this test secondly let us see the antigen test a covid-19 antigen refers to any foreign material or viral proteins in the body which will trigger a immune response this test helps to identify the antigens which are related to covid-19 viruses this test is also called as rapid antigen test and it gives the results which are faster than the molecular test but here also nasal or throat swab is taken but there is a drawback antigen test have high chance of missing the active infection thirdly let us see antibody test see it's also called as serology test and it screens for the covid-19 antibodies in the blood it tells if a patient is previously infected with covid-19 viruses the antibody test does not look for the active viruses but it checks whether one's immune system has responded to the infection this test also needs blood samples See these are the three major type of test for covid-19 infection see this is all about the discussion 
in our discussion we saw about the basics of covid-19 virus and in the second part we saw about the three major test for the covid-19 viruses with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis look at this editorial article this editorial is basically a criticism on the union government this article mainly criticizes the government regarding the use of prevention of money laundering act 2002 moreover it also talks about the frequent use of enforcement directorate to arrest the legislators in the opposition ruled states this article also states that union government uses the pmla act against various judgments of the supreme court lastly it also criticizes the activity of the government by saying that it goes against the federalism which is one of the basic structures of the indian constitution see this is about the editorial article the article may look so cynical but we as an aspirant who want to enter civil services should develop the virtue of political neutrality and impartiality so from this kind of article we can just take criticism points regarding pmla and use it in our critical analysis okay with this basics let us get into discussion so in our discussion today let us try to answer a main question about pmla 2002 look at the question what is money laundering and how it is a lifeline to the organized crime operations around the world and moreover critically analyze the effectiveness of the pmla in preventing the money laundering in india okay see the question demands three things first we have to write about money laundering then we have to write about the relationship between money laundering and organized crimes and finally we have to write about the criticism surrounding the pmla in the last part we must mainly focus on the effectiveness of the pmla in preventing money laundering in our country okay this is the skeleton of how our answer should be this question can be asked in the gs paper 3 under the sub topic of challenges to internal security through communication networks role of media social networking site in internal security challenges and there of okay we saw the question and the relevant syllabus now let us start answering the question in the introduction part you can define money laundering and add some data regarding the phenomenon money laundering is the act by which the proceeds of a crime are made to appear legitimate according to un convention against the transnational organized crime money laundering involves knowingly converting the money or moving property which is obtained from a crime to hide its illegal origin or to assist someone in the original crime to avoid punishment money laundering involves a series of step to disguise the origin of illicit funds the prime focus of money laundering as i already mentioned is to disguise the origins of illicit funds as if it came from the legitimate sources okay this is typically includes three stages placement that is introducing illegal funds into financial system layering creating a complex transactions to obscure the money trail and finally integration making the funds appear to be legitimate okay see the enforcement directorate is a india's primary agency for combating financial crimes annually it publishes the report detailing the value of the proceeds of crimes which were attached and confiscated under the pmla let us see the data in 2021 to 22 financial year the ed attached a poc worth over 55000 crores related to money laundering see this figure however only represents a portion of the total laundered money activity which was detected and it does not reflect the broader economic output for instance let us see a data a 2012 report by the central bureau of investigation estimates that india loses around 50 billion dollars annually through tax evasion which is associated with money laundering see i have given you an elaborate introduction you can precise it and use it in a concise manner okay this is about the introduction now let us get into body part of the answer here we have to write about the money laundering and its link to organized crimes see money laundering often has a strong connection to organized crimes Firstly the organized crime groups engage in various illegal activities like drug trafficking human trafficking arms smuggling extortion fraud etc these criminal ventures generate substantial amount of illicit money or dirty money since these criminal organization cannot use this illegal funds openly due to their illegitimate origin to make this money appear legitimate and usable they employ money laundering techniques After laundering the money these organized crime groups integrate the laundered money into the legitimate economy see money laundering allows the criminal organizations to sustain their illegal activity by reinvesting the laundered fund see reinvesting the laundered fund ensures a continuous cycle of generating illegal profit laundering them and furthering criminal operations in addition to this the organized crime groups uses the laundered money without drawing attention from law enforcement or financial regulators they also use the laundered money to bribe officials and fund the other criminal ventures without any suspicion 
This is why money laundering is considered as a backbone of organized crime. See, let me explain the linkage between money laundering and organized crime with a simple example. Let us take a fictional character. Let us name it as One Punch Bhavani. Here, One Punch Bhavani is a drug lord. Bhavani makes money by selling narcotics. In fact, he makes a lot of money by selling narcotics. But can Bhavani actually spend this money? The answer is no. Let us say, Bhavani tries to buy a Toyota Fortuner with this dirty money. If he pays the entire sum in cash, the showroom people will not accept it or they will ask for PAN card details. Bhavani cannot provide his PAN card details as the money he is providing is unaccounted one. So, for Mr. One Punch Bhavani to use his drug money, he must launder it first. So, without money laundering, organized crime will not be very lucrative. Here, moreover, I want to quote a dialogue from the, one of the greatest TV shows, The Wire. The Wire is about a political investigation into crime in the city of Baltimore. While investigating the drug trade, one of the detectives in the show, which is played by Lester Freeman, mentions that if you follow drugs, you get drug addicts and drug dealers. But if you start to follow the money, you don't know where it is going to take you. See, this statement basically sums up the relationship between organized crime and money laundering. With this, we have addressed the first part of the question quite in an elaborate manner. Let us move on to the second part of the question. Here, we have to analyze the role of PMLA in curbing the money laundering. To deal with the dangerous money laundering activity, India enacted the PMLA in 2002. Despite the act being enacted in the 2002, it came into force only from 2005. The main objective of PMLA is to prevent and control the money laundering and to confiscate and seize the property which is obtained from laundered money. But is the PMLA effective in achieving the stated objective? The answer is complicated. This is because even though PMLA is a well-intentioned act, it has many issues in it. The first issue is the narrow focus. The PMLA primarily addresses specific crimes associated with money laundering. For example, the Supreme Court in Vijay Madanlal Choudhury and others versus Union of India case limited the PMLA's application to the wrongful and illegal gain of property which is a result of the criminal activity which is related to scheduled offences. Here, scheduled offences are included in Part A, B and C of the PMLA Act. Due to the narrow focus, it excludes several other financial crimes such as tax evasion, corruption, etc. The second issue is the complex legal process. The legal procedures mentioned in the PMLA are very time consuming. These complexities often result in delayed justice and protracted trials. This discourages the law enforcement authorities from pursuing actions against the various individuals who involve in money laundering. Okay. The third issue is lack of collaboration. Insufficient collaboration among the enforcement agencies who are investigating this phenomenon often leads to the duplication of effort and wasteful of resources. So the absence of effective collaboration reduces the collective impact in combating money laundering. The next issue is the lack of adequate resources. There is an issue of resource shortage including insufficient personal and outdated technology. This resource deficiency acts as a hurdle in the effective combating of money laundering activities. The next issue is use of PMLA and ED as a political tool. See, the union government has been using this acts and the authorities to stifle the opposition by mainly targeting the legislators from the opposition states. This goes against the spirit of federalism. Lastly, there is an issue of political intervention. This potentially hinders the PMLA's efficacy in holding those people accountable before law. Such interferences might compromise the impartiality and integrity of the legal process. See, these are all some of the issues of PMLA 2002. Okay, but on the other hand, PMLA also has some positive aspects. See, the first positive is the burden of proof. According to section 24 of the PMLA, the burden of proof is on the accused to prove his innocence. Normally, in most of the cases, a burden of proof must be provided by the government to prove that the accused is guilty. But in PMLA cases, the accused is considered guilty and the accused must prove that he is not guilty and innocent. This act as an effective deterrence against the money laundering activities. Secondly, according to section 45, all cases are cognizable and non-bailable. So, ED can arrest an individual without any warrant subject to certain conditions. See, this also provides an effective deterrence against corruption. Thirdly, to increase the effectiveness of PMLA, certain provisions of the Act were amended in 2019. One of the important changes brought by the 2019 amendment was regarding Section 2. See, Section 2 of the Act was amended to expand the scope of proceeds of crime or POC. See, in this juncture, we ought to know what does proceeds of crime means. Okay, let me give you an example. Let us consider a person named Sandaram. His profession is dealing drugs, which is an illegal activity. Okay, what Santanam does, he launders the money he makes by selling drugs and he buys a prime real estate in Annanagar, Chennai. 
this real estate now comes under proceeds of crime by 2019 amendment which i had told that it expanded the scope of poc or proceeds of crime with the expansion of scope the enforcement directorate can take action against those property which may directly or indirectly be derived or obtained as a result of any criminal activity related to scheduled offence this expanded scope of pmla in turn will effectively curb the money laundering activity see these are all some of the positive aspects of pmla so the pmla has both positives and negative this is why i earlier mentioned that the answer to the question is pmla effective is complicated now that we have analyzed the effectiveness of pmla in curbing money laundering we can move on to the conclusion part of the answer see you can end your answer on a positive note you can mention some data to highlight the pmla in action you can mention that according to data from fiu or financial intelligence unit approximately 14000 suspicious transaction reports and over 1000 pmla cases were submitted in 2020 this shows that pmla is effective but to make it even more effective the ingrained issues of pmla have to be addressed see this can be your balanced conclusion see this is all regarding this discussion in our discussion we have elaborately saw the various provisions of the pmla and we have discussed about the issues and the positives of this act so with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis look at this news article namdappa flying squirrel has been found again in arunachal pradesh know that it went missing for nearly 42 years It was last seen in 1981 based on a single individual which was found in Namdappa Tiger Reserve in Arunachal Pradesh. See this is the crux of the news article. In our context let us know some key facts about Namdappa flying squirrel and also let us see about zoological survey of India. See the Namdappa flying squirrel is a rare and elusive species of flying squirrel found in the northeastern Arunachal Pradesh. This squirrel was discovered in 1981 in the Narnadappa National Park. So that's how it got its name. This flying squirrel has distinct physical features including a membrane called patagium that allows it to fly between the trees. Now let us look at the habitat and distribution of the species. See, it primarily inhabits the high altitude forests of Namdappa National Park. It specifically occurs in the area with dense vegetation and tree cover. Know that it is an endemic species. meaning that it is found exclusively in the namdappa national park region now let us see about the conservation status see it is considered as a critically endangered species under iucn red list if you are conserving it means it should have had threats na so let us see what are the threats faced by them firstly with respect to poaching of animals for food secondly with respect to habitat loss and degradation thirdly various geophysical phenomena like landslides and flooding which results in the habitat loss of this species Now let us see the notable behavior of this squirrel. See, Namdappa species is a nocturnal like most flying squirrels. It means they are active only during the night for feeding and other movements. Its diet primarily consists of fruit, nuts, seeds and possibly insects. This is all we need to know about the Namdappa flying squirrel. Now we shall see about the second topic, Zoological Survey of India. See, Zoological Survey of India is a subordinate organization of the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Note that it is not a statutory body. It's a national center for the survey of animals and the exploration of the resources leading to the advancement of knowledge. See, ZSI or Zoological Survey of India was established in 1916. It has its headquarters at Kolkata and moreover it had 16 regional stations which is located in different geographical locations of the country. See, Zoological Survey of India has been declared as a designated repository for the national zoological collections as per the National Biodiversity Act 2002. Moreover, ZSI publishes the Red Data Book on Indian Animals. See, it was first published in 1983 and is similar to Red Data Book which was published by IUCN. That's all about the discussion. In our discussion, we saw about two environment topics which are Namdappa flying squirrel and Zoological Survey of India. So with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis look at this news article anshuman patnaik has been chosen by the competition commission of india to lead its investigation unit see he has an experience in overseeing the various investigations and cases which involved various big companies notably mr patnaik has been involved in examining the various actions of alphabets inks google and other similar companies See this is the crux of the news article. So in this context let us see about competition commission of India from our exam perspective. To see this we need to go for a flashback. 
See, in 1960s and 70s, there was an act called Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act 1969, that is MRTP Act. See, the aim of the act is to control the monopolies and prohibit the monopolistic and restrictive trade practices. Years rolled on and this act was replaced and repealed by the Competition Act 2002. See, this was replaced based on the recommendation of Raghavan Committee. So, in a nutshell, the Competition Commission of India is a statutory body established under Competition Act 2002. And moreover, this Competition Act was further amended by Competition Amendment Act 2007. Now, let us see what is the purpose of this commission. Its main goal is to create and sustain the fair competition in the economy which will provide a level playing field to the producers and the make the markets work for the welfare of the customers. That is, it is working for both producers and customers in a market. So, the act prohibits various illegal practices like anti-competitive agreements, abuse of domestic position by the enterprises, etc. Moreover, it will also regulate acquisitions which cause or likely to cause adverse effect on the competitions within India. Now, let us see the composition. It consists of chairperson and six members which are appointed by the central government. On talking about their qualification, the chairperson and every other member should be a person of special knowledge and should have a professional experience of not less than 15 years in areas like economics, law, finance, accountancy and management etc. Let us see the appointment process. See, both chairperson and other members will be appointed by the central government based on the recommendation of a selection committee. See, this committee is headed by the Chief Justice of India or his nominee. The other members include the Secretary in the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and the Secretary in Law Ministry and Justice. Apart from them, there will be also two experts who possess special knowledge and professional experience will also be a part of this committee. Now let us see what is the tenure of the members. Note that the chairperson and every other member of the team will hold office for a term of 5 years provided they have not attained the age of 65. Note that they are also eligible for reappointment. In case of vacancy caused by the resignation or removal of chairperson or any other member, then such position shall be filled with a fresh appointment based on the set committee recommendation. And in case of vacancies in the chairperson's office, the senior most member shall act as a chairperson until the new person is chosen. This is all about the news discussion. In our analysis, we saw about the structural part of the important economic organization called Competition Commission of India. With this learned points, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis. Look at this news article. Recently, both the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha have passed the post the bill 2023. The bill is now waiting the assent of the president. Note that the bill aims to replace the Indian Post Office Act 1898. This text and context article written here is regarding this bill only. The article covers the important provisions of the bill and the criticism around the bill. So in this discussion, let us cover them in a brief. Let us start with the important features of the bill. The first major change which is brought by the bill is regarding the exclusive privilege of the central government. The 1898 Act provides that wherever the central government establishes the posts, it will have the exclusive privilege of conveying the letters by the post. But this bill does not provide for such privileges. The bill also states that India Post will have the exclusive privilege over issuing of the postage stamps. The next future is regarding the appointment of Director General of Postal Services. See, this act provides for the appointment of such authority. Moreover, it provides that the Director General may make regulations regarding the charges for services and supply and sale of the postal stamps and postal stationeries. The third and the most contentious provision is regarding the powers to intercept the postal articles. See, the bill allows for the interception of the postal articles on various grounds. The grounds being the security of the states, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, emergency, public safety or contraventions of the provisions of the bill or any other law. The bill also states that central government may empower an officer of India post to deliver the postal article to the customs authority or any other specified authority. The said authority will then deal with the item in the question. The next important future is regarding the exemption of liability. See, the post office is exempted from the liabilities related to its services. The bill also states that the officers are not liable unless they act fraudulently or cause loss, delay or misdelivery in a deliberate manner. The last change is regarding the offences and penalties. See, the bill removed the various offences and the penalties which are provided under 1898 Act. The bill only provides punishment for amounts not paid by the user. 
these are all various provisions of the bill having seen the provisions let us see the criticism surrounding the bill the first criticism is regarding the violation of the right to privacy critics argue that the bill violates the fundamental rights to privacy it enables the state surveillance without adequate safeguards which is potentially compromising the privacy of the citizens the second criticism is regarding the lack of clarity and guidelines see there are various issues due to the vague ground for the interception absence of clear definitions for the terms like emergency and the absence of guidelines for the interception critics feels that this vagueness will lead to misinterpretation thereby curtailing the rights of the citizens the last issue is regarding the absence of a grievance redressal mechanism the bill lacks a grievance redressal mechanism for citizens who might be subjected to interception this prevents them from raising concerns about such actions by the government see these are all some of the issues with the post office bill 2023 See this TNC article quotes two important supreme court judgments regarding the right to privacy which you can directly quote in your main answer now let us see the judgments in a brief the first judgment is regarding the people union of civil liberty versus union of india case 1996 in this case the supreme court stressed the importance of having protections in place to prevent unfair or random use of surveillance by the government basically the supreme court said that there must be no room for vagueness in the guidelines regarding wherever the government can undertake surveillances the next important judgment is regarding the justice case putasami versus union of india case 2017 in this case the court declared that the right to privacy is a fundamental right the supreme court also stated that any action by the government which is affecting the privacy must meet certain criteria the criteria being it must be lawful it should have a valid purpose it should be appropriate and necessary and it should not excessively restrict the rights and it must include measures to prevent the potential misuse see this judgments underlines the significance of safeguarding the privacy and emphasizing the need for a clear cut legislations this is all regarding this news discussion in our dnc discussion we saw about the important provisions of post office bill 2023 In our second part, we discussed about the criticism and the various judgments regarding the right to privacy by the Supreme Court of India. This is all regarding this discussion. With these learned points, let us conclude this and take up the next news article for our analysis. Look at this news article. Yesterday, the Rajya Sabha passed three new bills which after becoming law will administer the criminal justice system of India. They are Bharatiya Nyaya Second Samhita Bill, the Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Second Samhita Bill and the Bharatiya Sakshya Second Bill. See, these three bills are set to replace the existing criminal laws such as Indian Penal Code 1860, Code of Criminal Procedure CRPC 1973 and Indian Evidence Act 1872 respectively. As the bills were now passed by Rajya Sabha, they will be sent to the president for assent and soon they are going to become laws. See, this is the crux of the news article. In our discussion, we will understand the key provisions of the three bills. Now, first let us take Bharatiya Nyaya Second Sanhita Bill 2023. See this bill seeks to replace the Indian Penal Code 1860 the bill aims to repeal nearly 22 provisions of the IPC know that the bill also proposes changes to the 175 existing provisions of IPC additionally the bill introduces eight new sections to the Indian Penal Code now first let us understand the changes to the existing provisions of our IPC firstly the punishment for all types of gang rape under IPC will be enhanced As per the new bill, the offenders who commit the gang rape will now get 20 years of imprisonment or life imprisonment. Secondly, the punishment for the rape of a minor under the IPC will also be enhanced. As per the bill, a person who involved in raping a minor will get death penalty. Moreover, note that for the first time, the bill introduces capital punishments for the offense of mob lynching. The bill states that the offense of mob lynching would be punishable with 7 years of imprisonment or life imprisonment also. Fourthly the bill proposes to omit the provisions for the offences of adultery see this is in line with the supreme court's ruling under joseph shine versus union of india case see this case declared that section 497 of the ipc was unconstitutional note that 497 of the ipc dealt with the criminalization of adultery see these are some of the important changes brought to ipc under the bharatiya nyaya sanhita bill 2023 Now moving on to see about the new sections that are being included in the IPC. Firstly, the bill introduces section 109. See, this new section will deal with the organized crimes like drug trafficking and smuggling so on. Secondly, the bill introduces section 110. This section will deal with the petty organized crime like automobile or jewelry theft. 
Then the third section is section 111. See, this is an important section which deals with the offences related to terrorist acts. Fourthly, with respect to section 302. See, this section will deal with the snatching issues. And finally, section 150. See, this section will deal with the acts of a person which will endanger the sovereignty, unity and integrity of India. Section 150 says that if any person commits an act that endangers the sovereignty or unity of India, then such person shall be punished with imprisonment and he is also liable to pay fine. Note that this section 150 has been introduced to deal with the sedition. This new bill will replace the section 124A of the IPC which has still dealt with the sedition. Ironically, the bill retains the sedition in another form by introducing a new section called section 150. See, this is all about the Bharatiya Nyaya Sanhita Bill 2023. Now, let us move on to see about Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Second Sanhita Bill 2023. See, this bill will replace the Criminal Procedure Code of 1973. The bill seeks to repeal 9 provisions of the CRPC. The bill also proposes changes to 160 provisions of the CRPC. In addition to this, the bill also introduces 9 provisions to the CRPC. Okay, now let us see some important provisions related to our exam. Firstly, the bill seeks to introduce a new section called Section 230. This section mandates that a copy of FIR should be available to the accused and the victim at free of cost. Know that it further states that the FIR shall be made available within 14 days from the date of production or appearance of the accused. This provision ensures transparency in the investigation procedures of the police. Secondly, the bill permits the filing of zero FIR from any part of the country. Now, we are to know about what is the concept of zero FIR. See, when a police station receives a complaint regarding an alleged offence committed in the jurisdiction of another police station, zero FIR mandates that the initial police stations which received the complaint now, it has to register the FIR and later it has to transfer the FIR to the relevant police station for further investigation. See, this is for the concept of zero FIR. So, it eases or it permits the filing of zero FIR from any part of the country. Thirdly, the bill allows for the examination of the accused persons through electronic means like video conferencing. It will help to expedite the investigation process. See, this is all about the Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sanhita Bill 2023. Now finally, let us see Bharatiya Shaksha Second Bill 2023. See, this bill will replace the Indian Evidence Act of 1872. The new bill proposes changes to 23 provisions of the Indian Evidence Act. It also introduces one provision to the Act. Now let us see some important provisions in this bill. Firstly, the bill permits the use of electronic or digital records as evidence. As per the bill, the electronic or digital record will have a legal validity as a documentary evidence. So it can be used as an evidence. Secondly, the bill expands the ambit of secondary evidence. For example, the copies which were made from the original evidence by a mechanical process can also be considered as the secondary evidence. Like this, the bill expands the ambit of secondary evidence. See, this is all about the Bharatiya Shaksha Bill 2023. See, this is all about this discussion. In our discussion, we saw about the three new bills regarding our criminal justice system. This is all regarding the discussion. Now, let us move on to the next part of our video that is to discuss the preliminary practice questions. Today, we are having four questions. Let us solve them one by one. See the first question. Which of the following symptoms is commonly associated with COVID-19 and distinguishes it from the other respiratory illnesses? See, out of four options, A, C, D are very generic and will be common to all other respiratory illnesses. So, eliminating all of them, the correct option would be option B. See the second question. Which of the following about Namdappa flying squirrel is correct? See the first statement. It is endemic to India, Nepal and Bhutan. See, from our discussion, we saw that it is endemic only to Arunachal Pradesh, India. So, the statement A is wrong. See the second statement. It is listed as the least concern by IUCN. See, from our analysis, we saw that it is listed as a critically endangered species under IUCN. So, it is also wrong. Third one, it primarily inhibits wetlands and lakes. See, from our discussion, we saw that the Namdapa flying squirrel is commonly found in the high altitude forest of the Namdapa National Park. So, this is also wrong. See the final statement. It's a nocturnal species known for its ability to glide between the trees. See, this statement is correct. So, the correct option is option D. See the third question of the day. Consider the following statements about Competition Commission of India. First statement, it was established under Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act 1969. See, it is incorrect because CCA or Competition Commission of India is established under Competition Act 2002. See, this act replaces the MRTP Act. Let us see the second statement. 
CCA consists of chairperson and maximum of four members. See from our discussion, we can easily say that it consists of maximum six members. See the third statement. The decisions of the CCA can be appealed only to Supreme Court of India. See this is incorrect because the appeals from the Competition Commission of India can be made in National Company Law Appellate Tribunal or NCLAT. So eliminating all of them, the correct option is option D. See the final question of the day. The Post Office Bill 2023 allows for the interception of the postal articles on various grounds. How many of the below mentioned grounds are stated in the bill? First statement, security of the state. Second one, friendly relations with foreign states. Third one, public order. Fourth one, emergency. Fifth one, public safety. See, from our common sensical perspective, we can easily say that all these five situations will come as a ground for any exception. So, all of them are correct. So, the correct option is option D. See, the main question based on today's analysis is listed here. Interested aspirants can write and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, you can like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding civil service preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Thank you.